Uh, kia ora everybody. Uh, welcome to this afternoon's Performance and Monitoring Committee meeting. Uh, as you all know, the meeting will be live streamed to our huge international audience and local audience. Um, and uh, if anyone online is seeing their, uh, the councillors with iPads, it's because some of them use those <coughs> um, to read all of their materials, so uh, that's the reason why iPads are up. Um, the opening prayer or opening blessing or opening karakia, uh, when I was sitting here earlier this morning, I wasn't too sure who was actually going to undertake that. Uh, so I've written my own uh, this afternoon, and it's nice, short and sweet. Uh, it is, let's have a great meeting. Everyone can contribute. We, have, uh, we move forward with great outcomes for future prosperity of Hastings. Thank you. Um, and we have no one for Zoom attendees, um, so and apologies and leave of absence. Uh, we have count, apologies from Councillor Hickey and Councillor Lawson, uh, and a leave of absence for Councillor Kerr. Is anyone else missing? Councillor Nepi? Is he an apology? No? Okay. No apology there. Um, can I have someone move those, please? Just a request for leave for that absence, Chair. Oh, sure, yeah. 18th, 19th, 20th of September. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else leave of absence? They uh, can also be picked up in the following meeting after this, too. No? Okay. Sorry, mover. Thank you. Kevin, second. Anna, all in favour? Thank you. Uh, conflicts of interest, we will work through those as we go. I'm not sure whether there will actually be any. It's mostly council business. Um, so we will come to those as they arrive. <coughs> and confirmation of the previous minutes, I'm happy to move those um, to second, please. Thank you, Malcolm, and all in favour? Against? Thank you, carried. Right, moving on to item five. Uh, also, just to note... Uh, there is a full council meeting after this. The intention is to have a break at 2.45. Um, and so um, let's just see how we go uh, with the presentations and stuff that we have today. Um, we'd like to invite um, Michael Bassett-Foss, who is with the Regional Economic Development Agency, uh, to just run us through uh, where things are at and uh, where things are heading. <coughs> Thank you, Michael. Yeah. Kia ora Chair, kia ora tato. Um, so I've been supporting the establishment of RIDA, uh, RIDA short for Regional Economic Development Agency, uh, for a, about a year now. Um, the, uh, uh, have we got a presentation up? Up here. Make sure we get the right one. Um, and um, I, I just a, an apology first from Chair, Chairman. Um, no, it's not water. No. Um, yeah, uh, from from the Chair of Reader, Alistair McLeod. Um, he's uh, like everyone at the moment, um, sort of uh, chasing his tail on the, on a number of things. So um, yeah, just just disappointed he couldn't make it. Um, the, the establishment process reported to the chief executives of the five councils. They provided oversight right through this process. Uh, we were meeting uh, weekly at the outset, and that extended to bi-weekly and uh, sort of out now to around about a, a month. Um, I just also acknowledge that the um, councils really lent in with their economic development agency leads and their networks and their NAUS, uh, you know, to support the process. Um, as we provided, um, uh, you know, pr uh, made progress through this. Um, the, the, the paper that you've got was written a couple of months ago, uh, and it's, uh, it's, it's provided by way of a, a one-year update on Reader's development, albeit that Reader's been going through an establishment phase during that process. Uh, the first presentation I gave was to a wider district council in late May, um, and, and this is the last of the council updates as we progress forward. So this is awesome. Yeah. So, um, listen, I'll, I'll take the paper largely as read. 
Um, I'm going to highlight some key themes through half a dozen slides, and then I just welcome a quarter to, and you know we can answer questions as we go. Um, and and um, let's reach right into this. Just a little bit of background about um, Rita. You know, councils took the bold move uh, in late 2021 to uh, fund an organisation that had the mana, uh, the resourcing and the credibility to uh, lead regional economic development on behalf of, of the region. Um, in March uh, 22, so that was just over a year ago, uh, the establishment group came together uh, representing um, the, th the tri-party um, uh, partnership that RIDA was going to be based on, um, iwi hapu, councils and business. Um, over the pursuing months, they embedded the reader um, organisation or its construct into the regional co-governance framework, being Matariki, uh, and Matariki agreed uh, to take um, strategic uh, oversight or, or provide strategic guidance on the direction for, for RIDA. Um, and, of course, um, um, mayors uh, and chief executives, or mayors and, and chairs of um, PSGE, sit on that um, that body. They also uh, took responsibility for appointing board members for Rita. Uh, Rita is to be a a, council, a, um, a non council controlled um, organisation, uh, a separate individual company with um, a skills based board. The um, and a appointments panel was, was selected or nominated by Matariki. They went through a two to three month process of appointing a skills-based board uh, in late 22, and they were appointed, appoint, finally appointed and endorsed in December. Uh, the board came together for its first meeting, its induction meeting in January. Its second meeting was canceled, of course, uh, due to the cyclone. So since then, um, Rita put on hold its chief executive recruitment uh, process and um, rallied around its key stakeholder organisations. Um, it held um, HUI twice a week with key business facing organisations to understand the extent of the damage and they extended out to weekly and are now out to monthly and will be ongoing. Um, and did a lot of work with, um, uh, as you will well know, uh, you were engrossed in your own activities around the immediate response and recovery. Uh, and the board lent right into ensuring dots were joined as well as possible between the various organisations so that we could move forward as best we could. So um, I think uh, if there was ever a time that a region needs uh, a regional voice for economic development, it's now uh, in the wake of a significant event like uh, we've had around the region. So... Um, RIDA has been working very closely with the regional recovery framework, uh, and now that the agency is established, is, is supporting them, uh, and likewise them supporting us in leadership of the economic growth PO. Um, now, it's obvious that, that you know, the, the primary sector, uh, the infrastructure components, uh, and other parts of the recovery framework are all vital for economic development, so RIDA's um, taken it upon itself to ensure that dots are joined between the various PO, um, you know, areas of progress. What I'm going to do now is I'm just going to switch to a couple of slides that were presented to um, two hui that Rita pulled together um, in formation of the Regional Recovery Plan. Um, it joined together the primary PO and the economic PO uh, sector uh, leadership uh, within the region. We had about 30 people um, in energe energetically participate and lean into the development of the priorities inside the recovery uh, plan. Um, the objective is up there. The first plan, as you know, uh, was for a six-month focus. The second plan... Um, it's sort of under development. Is, I think it's due for submission in around about September. Um, the priorities within the economic growth PO that were agreed by that HUI, um, uh, I won't rattle through all the words, but the first area is around supporting business. Um, second area is around just acknowledging there were localised impacts. Um, uh, Awatoto, uh, Firanaki, um, Wairo are sort of just being examples. Um, the third area is around uh, recognising 
uh, jobs flow between sectors as the various sectors sort of um, the effects of you know them were unfolding. The uh, the fourth one is around understanding the constraints and opportunities through a regional lens, and the last one is um, a, um, a a focus around progressive procurement um, in particular. So and under each of those priorities, there's there's an action plan uh, which is being rattled through at the moment uh, by the recovery agency. Um, during this time in discussion with stakeholders, um, the reader board have assembled their vision and their areas of focus. Um, naturally, there's a, a big focus around economic leadership. Uh, reader doesn't do this on its own. It's only a small organisation, but in collaboration and alignment with the priorities of the various organisations in the ecosystem um, to ensure that things get done a little bit more quickly, and to become the trusted voice within central government uh, on behalf of the region to advocate and amplify the messaging that goes to them on behalf of the, you know, the, the, the local areas. Um, uh, intelligence and insights, the board are keen to pick up on and coordinate, um, or a more coordinated approach to developing intelligence and insights across the region. Um, and you know, when the region is broken, a focus on key sectors that drive our region uh, to ensure that uh, we can do what we can for them. Uh, there's the reader construct. It's um, sort of, uh, I put it into an illustration because it is a little bit cluttered. Uh, there's the Matariki uh, governance framework, uh, providing strategic uh, direction and accountability. Uh, councils' uh, influence and control is via the funding agreements and operational orientated KPIs. Uh, and there's the you know, tri-party partnership uh, as shareholders into the organisation. Um, so, in terms of the um, operating relationship with councils, as described uh, or mentioned in the last slide, it's, it's via the funding agreement. Uh, this was written um, uh, with oversight of council CEs uh, late last year. Um, key components are outlined in the paper. Um, it, uh, it sort of revolves around uh, periodic meetings with CEs, annual review of KPIs, six-month reporting, and in effect, this one-year report is you know, giving effect to um, what will um, be in the funding agreement in due course. Um, you know, as I've described already, Reed is a small organisation, but aligning, importantly, with the Economic Development Aid uh, leads inside council is important uh, to form the one-team approach um, and, you know, leveraging those networks of knowledge. Uh, and I've talked already about amplifying local messages. Um, big, big area of um, uh, job for reader will be to manage expectations and be clear on what it will do and what it won't do. And, of course, in terms of, um, you know, uh, cyclone recovery, uh, yeah, things changed. And, um, you know, that's becoming a lot clearer now than it was a number of months ago. Um, a, 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 an issue with the last the, uh, the rendition of uh, sort of a, an, an agency was, was uh, not as clear transparency as, 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 as I understand councils wanted. So, reader will... Uh, publish its bu budgets. Um, currently, um, HBRC is holding the funds on behalf of the five councils um, and you know, paying the suppliers at the business hub. And um, they provided these numbers. The numbers is at the end of March, plus forecasted right through to the end of the year. Uh, the table on the left is the funding by each of the councils, pro rata. And the box on the right is uh, the operating costs um, coming through. Just noting also that there's a large cost, capital cost, for fit out at the business hub, um, which actually won't be paid this year. It'll, it, the work's only starting uh, tomorrow, which is which is quite exciting for us. Finally, uh, last couple of slides. Um, Matariki council CEs, uh, stakeholders, um, sort of agreed uh, oh, about the middle of last year that. If we, if we want to develop a new economic development agency for the reader, let's let's do it once and let's do it right, and let's give reader the the space um, to to form itself and um, and in support of the key stakeholders. So, you know, the chief executives not on board. They start in uh, the middle of August, um, and that was announced through um, 
you know, key, key stakeholder holder leadership um, uh, organisations uh, a number of weeks ago. So let Rita establish, uh, transfer the operations from Hawke's Bay Regional Council and the finances uh, and the supplier and, and staff agreements, um, and, and let it build its uh, relationships, meanwhile spinning up its programme of work. Um, and over the last few months, that's sort of gaining traction. Uh, in terms of next steps, some of which have happened, some of which are still evolving, um, I won't read through those, but what I will just talk about are the areas of activity that have spun up over the, over the last few months. Um, firstly, um, you know, Hastings has been the winner out of the business hub uh, that's uh, come and established itself, um, half a million dollars being spent up the road um, over the next couple of months and some you know, well-qualified staff uh, fronting business on behalf of the region and, and the intent by all players for this to be you know, one of the front doors for business in the region. Um, the, um, uh, the, the council CEs had the foresight to start a piece of work on the, a regional freight distribution uh, network strategy uh, late last year. And uh, again, um, foresight, you know, being that now this, um, this document uh, has been round and consulted on with various key leadership organisations. Uh, it's been reported back to Matariki a couple of weeks ago uh, that oversaw sort of the original uh, terms of reference. But it's got in it uh, about 12 priority areas of work for um, roading and rail infrastructure, and they will inform uh, Waka Kotahi. Um, and the regional recovery agency around the infrastructure post. So, you know, really important um, pieces of work. Not surprisingly, the main arterial roads uh, feature in the top few, um, along with things like aligning the rail network with the, with the main road network to reduce uh, road crossings and, and, and other things too. Um, uh, likewise, it started a piece of similar work around the comms um, infrastructure in and out of the region. You know, particularly important for Napier that lost uh, comms and electricity for the better part of a, a, um, a week and is, po and is leaning in heavily around the electricity network too. Intelligence Hub I've spoken about. Um, the reader board uh, sort of agreed four uh, areas. Uh, one is around um, a data portal, uh, providing um, you know, access to data to key agencies so that it's the same data being used rather than different sets of data like now currently across councils, for example, so that the, you know, when um, stakeholders are telling the story about the region, they can tell the same story using the same data. Uh, secondly, uh, a, a dashboard of, of key KPIs, um, you know, that's, that's regularly updated and can be used by all parties. Thirdly, a um, business analyst or economist type of resource or access to that can actually ground truth some of the data and turn it into um, insights and, and stories. And lastly, which the board have prioritised as an impact assessment for the region, which will be twisted into a you know, medium-term investment uh, prospectus for stakeholders to use in the region, identifying uh, you know, what, what investment would give the big, biggest bang for buck and, and where. And again, you know, that'll be a valuable tool for councils to use. Um, I've talked about leaning into progressive procurement. Um, there was a hui held uh, a couple of weeks ago with, with councils, with um, um, agencies providing um, uh, capability de development to uh, Māori and Pacific organisations um, and to government agencies recently that I've identified uh, opportunities, uh, challenges um, and, and, and areas of activity that would value that piece of work. Uh, and just lastly, you know, leaning in alongside the regional recovery agency to give effect to the region's recovery and, and moving forward. So, Chair, I'll, I'll leave it there. I've spoken for, for longer than I had intended to, but welcome questions. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Thank you, through you, Chair. Um, thank you, Michael, for your update. Um, when we met recently, you talked about having doing some... Um, economic analysis of uh, Cyclone Gabriel's impact on our economy. Is, do we know if that work has started? Yeah, no, the work hasn't started. The, 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 the development of the terms of reference has, um, and I'm hoping in the next days to, to start the engagement process to make sure that we capture you know, the relevant stakeholder needs in that document. Great, thank yeah. you. 
And my second question um, through you, Chair, is just understanding the progress of procurement. You talked about opportunities and challenges. Um, I only see opportunities. Um, uh, so I'd be really interested to, if you could just expand a little bit, because we're really wanting to, you know, with all of this net massive spend post-cyclone uh, across um, particularly our or here of Hedi Tonga, how, how we how we uh, capture some of that and move quite quickly. So could you just tell me about the work that's been done to date? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, it became blindingly clear from the discussions uh, and, uh, you know, prior to um, our afterwards and at the HUI that there's a lot of organisations doing some reasonably good um, activity in the progressive procurement space, uh, but they're all on various stages of a journey. And, on, you know, councils likewise. Hastings, I would say, is, you know, well in front and, you know, you're training program to your, to, to your staff and so forth is um, exemplary, and it'd be great to sort of share that. So, um, and, um, but, but there's other organisations that are actually, you know, um, not, not doing so well. So I think important is to get some visibility um, of that, and all the organisations involved supported a, a monitoring framework of sorts. Um, you know, councils uh, have agreed to a policy and some guidelines around progressive procurement, but um, that's not mandatory. But let's just shine a light on how things actually are going and then provide the support between the agencies where it's needed to ensure progress. So one is a is an auditing monitoring uh, framework um, that, that, that we would uh, you know like to see the private sector organizations use as well. Um, the another area of work is around um, uh, sh sharing best practice and showing the value of progressive procurement because a lot of people can just see the cost that it might bring around a procurement process. But when you think that um, it's not just about employing local, it's about um, providing training opportunities and pathways through employment for local people, so that when the bridge is built or the, you know, the road is fixed, um, that afterwards uh, it's not just the injection of money to do that piece of work, but you've got a more capable workforce that can contribute to and participate in um, you know, economic development moving forward. So when you think of long-term resilience, you know, that sort of underpins uh, the thinking of, of, of the board, certainly. Um, there was the, um, a, a discussion around the opportunity for a case study, uh, taking a Māori or Pacifica business uh, that lacks some, some you know, areas of capability to fully participate in a procurement process through a government agency or a, or, or a council who are often the procurers, um, take them through the you know, capability development that can be provided um, you know, um, and, and learn from the process of, of participating in that um, you know, procurement process um, so that we can inform all and use it as a case study. Um, there are a number, I'm, I'm just sort of flavouring off the top of my head sort of two or three areas that I think that we can really start to, to make some progress on. Great, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Paul. Thank you, uh, thank you for the report, Michael. You may have answered my question in your answer to um, Sandra, but it's not explicit in your focus in 2.11, which is really um, education and training for the workforce, uh, which has got a two-way benefit. One, it's um, the resources there, but also it's the conduit for the economic benefit getting back into the community through employment. And I'm just wondering whether it could be a bit more explicit in, in the focus, rather than utilising the labour force, actually training the labour force to, uh, for the local economy. Yeah, it's, uh, hey, oh, yeah, point taken, um, and, and, and we'll re reflect on that absolutely. Just conscious that there's a lot of organisations uh, in, in the training and skills development um, space, uh, you know, and so, you, you know, for an uh, economic development agency, we'd, we'd need to sit back and see where we add value or where we get in the way. Um, and often it's the juncture of the training and um, business and ensuring the, the, the gap is, is, is better bridged. Um, the, um, and, and, and more specifically, the Reader Board have discussed uh, opportunities in the housing space and skills development for immediate recovery around ensuring the um, you know, the local workforce has the skills through those training services uh, to participate in some of the, the 
recovery work. So your example's spot on. Thank you. Councillor Butter. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'll just take the there's a number of new councillors in the room that came in at the last election before Rita was discussed. And we're obviously coming to the end of a process where Rita has been being established and is now presumably getting on with its work or starting to get to that stage. Um, I'd love to know more about what gap Rita was trying to fill, um, what you see as your key outputs and, and how you would feel like you were being successful. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and, and to be honest, you know, in terms of outputs and, and you know, what does winning look like, you know, things changed a little bit in mid-February um, for, for everybody. So, you know, that, 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 that piece of the pie is, is probably still evolving. But what I would um, recommend to some of the newer councillors that, that weren't involved with some of the early process, there were, there's two really good reports that were written, commissioned by, by councils, um, on the industry support and economic development ecosystem. Uh, the first one identified, uh, actually Lee was a lot closer to this than I was, but identified the opportunities and the challenges and, and the need, uh, which, which, which is a, in a, in a one-line summary was an organisation that had the mana and the resourcing to, you know, to, to represent the region, um, which I've referred to already. The second report um, took a closer look at, at what the organisation, um, um, how it might be constructed in the areas of activity that, that it might undertake. Could we have that as an action to share that with the new council? Sure, thanks. Thank you. Um, just a question from me, <clears throat> going through the um, focus areas and KPIs, um, in knowing that over the 20 plus years that I've been in and, in and around business, there have been several renditions of economic development agencies. And what we want to make sure is that one, they are successful and therefore our community is also successful. And I just want to point to and test um, for you to pass on really back to your board and also to um, the new chief executive that the, the KPIs to me just aren't actually specific enough. Um, you know, we can you can tick the boxes from an operationalised organisation, so all of that sort of stuff is the establishment. But if you look at the rest of them, I'm not sure how we're going to mark up against them and, and therefore continue um, to fund and support uh, to the level we do now or to a, an, an additional level because we're seeing the benefit. So I think it's really important that over, you know, the, um, you know, it's t you know, the uh, entity was established and uh, well, the board was put in place in 20, December 2022. We're now halfway through a year. Um, but I think that has to be a priority, is actually to understand and, and get better clarity around those KPIs. Yeah, and Chair, I would concur with that. Um, and I think through the partnership committee that, that's, um, that's um, identified in the funding agreements, there's the opportunity to start to shape those up. And, um, you know, there is another report back process at the end of this year. So, you know, you'd like to think that there was uh, more measurable KPIs, as you describe, in those agreements. Yeah. So, I, so I'd like to add that as an, an additional action, is that we get um, a better understanding of what those KPIs are um, prior to the next six months, or, yeah, yeah, as soon as we get yeah. Thank you. Uh, so the recommendation before us is that we, we just accept the receive of the report. Um, is someone happy to? Thank you, Marcus and Wendy, all in favour? Any against? Thank you. Moved. Uh, and also, just before Lee leaves the table, uh, today is Lee's last day, second to last day, uh, in the role as our economic development um, lead. And um, I'm fortunate to go away to Melbourne with Lee six years ago in one of my first uh, roles when we were looking at CBD revitalisation, which also Lee was involved in. And uh, that's actually where he's heading. So <laughs> I'm not sure if uh, the trip, we made the trip so memorable that uh, you're actually now going back. But uh, just on behalf of all of us, uh, to you and Caroline, who's been a significant contributor as well, uh, best of luck. Thank you. Lee, Mr. Neville. We, someone else wants to say something. Oh. 
<laughs> Three, Mr Chair, I just thank you for the opportunity to briefly speak. Uh, yes, um, just like to carry on from the Chair's comments there. Um, I engaged Lee seven years ago and uh, Council has been very generous to myself and Lee and Raul Oosterkamp, um, giving us a, a fairly free reign to be entrepreneurial and achieve good economic development outcomes. Um, and Lee's proved to be a very steady, very effective and very reliable, steady pair of hands through that journey. Um, the ultimate of Lee's career is probably the Food East development, but he's been uh, key and um, pragmatically because he's both an engineer and an accountant, so um, he's pretty good at right angles and figures. So. But um, everything from sort of lean manufacturing and medium-sized companies and bringing them back from the brink and boosting employment um, through to, as I was commenting this morning, uh, we're now growing grapes at about $15 a grape that um, <laughs> uh, go on tables in Japan um, as a delicacy grown here in Hawke's Bay. So Lee, along with the rest of our team, has been crucial in facilitating and attracting millions of dollars worth of development and, and good quality outcomes for... Uh, Hastings and Hawke's Bay, so I uh, wish Lee uh, all the best on the next um, uh, phase of his life, very exciting phase, moving to Melbourne, giving me quite a bit to think about, so a bold move, so, um, and uh, uh, best wishes, and on behalf of Council Lee, thanks very much for your very fine service. get in there and take a risk and get involved and um, it'll help you grow and it's certainly been really rewarding for me um, having lost my job in 2009 as an engineer and then retraining as an accountant and moving to EIT and then moving here I have had some huge opportunities and um, as I pointed out to Craig this morning he's never said no to me maybe I'm just very good at convincing him I don't know <laughs> um, but he's probably been the best manager I've ever had in my career um, and he's very free with his words of wisdom, which um, usually turn out to be very accurate. So um, thank you very much. It's been great getting to know all of the councillors and the mayor, and I really appreciate the time I spent with you. And, um, yeah, I've, I've certainly made some, some great friends and had some awesome experiences, including watching um, some councillors take a wee swim in a certain stream. So I won't name who, but, yeah, that was great. Thank you very much, and um, I, I'll be watching how you guys get on going forward with some huge challenges for the for the region. So thank you very much. Okay, item six. Uh, we have the Toy Toy Operational Review uh, with Megan. Um, as I alluded to in an email, uh, there was quite a lot of quite a lot to read into this. Um, and yeah. Tēnā koutou katoa, everybody. Um, I'm taking the report as read and open for any questions. Marcus. A um, couple of things. Obviously, we've had a bit more of a, a loss than was expected. Mm -hmm. um, and in discussions with the Deputy Mayor last night, she was wondering about a couple of things around how um, the income captured the added value of hospitality, benefit for schools, communities, those kind of things, and how do we measure that? The income captured? The... So we've obviously made a financial loss over this period of time. There is other additional benefits to operating the mm -hmm. facility. Mm -hmm. um, how do we understand and measure those or understand the benefits those bring? Oh, great, thank you. Um, we have a, a survey that goes out annually to the whole community. 
Um, the last survey we had was, uh, I think we had 883 respondents um, and 97% were satisfied with the venue. So we asked quite a variation of questions. Um, we have a high risk survey that goes to every single person that uses the venue. So we are able to get feedback on um, the use of the venue and how that goes. Um, we work directly with schools, so we have an outreach program. So we get uh, feedback from schools, school unit users, hirers as well. So we have kind of a quite a range of ways of input into our um, monitoring of and measurements of, of satisfaction. Does that answer your question? Perfect. I think just read here just to sort of add to that. Um, so yeah, that, that the, the community commercial sort of different or well, the opportunities that are there for the toy toy and how they manage that that um, I guess dynamic of, of the need to have community events versus the commercial events that come in and support and subsidise the rate payer contribution to the operation of toy toy. Um, that's been an enduring I guess dynamic for as long as toy toy or also opera house before that um, was was in creation. So I think there is work that we need to do going forward to understand more fully, I guess, the, that that mix and, and where the right balance is. Um, and, um, Megan's report does go into some detail around you know, the mix of events that are happening and therefore the benefit to the community of having community events, um, even though the rate payer needs to subsidise those because they're, they're a discounted rate, they don't fully recover costs of having those events and therefore they, they create that imposition on rates going forward. So, but there is that, that balance between the commercial activities and the community. And I think there's some work that we do need to do in, in the years ahead, or the time ahead to refine that a bit more. Councillor Shalom. Um, thank you, Chair. Uh, and thank you for the report. Um, I'm, I'm keeping in mind that, um, as, as it says in the report, you've not had a full year of operation yet without some form of disaster, whether it was COVID-19 or cyclone. Um, and I'm also conscious that when Council in the past made a decision to invest as we did within the toy toy facilities that we always knew it was never going to completely wash its face because there would be the strong community element. Um, I'm just interested on a few points. So I see at the moment that it's roughly a 60% community use, 40% commercial use, is that correct? That's correct. Outside of the the interesting environment we found ourselves in of late with cyclones and also with the lack of ability for people to move around in international bookings with COVID-19. Mm -hmm. If we remove those barriers, what do you think Toy Toy would look like with, with bookings? Because I know there was a priority put on more local use mm -hmm. in those times. Absolutely. There's a lot of room for more utilisation mm -hmm. of the venue. I think the the way it's been set up with all the uh, multiple venues being able to work at the same time, that was never a possibility in the past, or not to the same extent. Um, and I think uh, it's interesting to note that um, the, the prior two years, or the second year in operation, I think our attendance levels were at 21,000. And this year, even with the cyclone, we were at 63,000. So we're really, really certain that we're going to exceed our revenue targets. and. We were really positive about the last financial year because we were like, COVID's gone, we're going we're gonna to really hit the sky. But obviously, um, we got affected. So, uh, no, the future is definitely bright and there's a lot more room for utilisation. And I think that's the tricky thing around the balance between community and commercial is making sure that uh, we know that there's enough product out there to keep booking, but we can't or we don't believe that, but we believe that by excluding one, it'll impact on the other. Mm -hmm. So even though our community users are um, paying a lesser rate, the relationships that we're develop developing with them are providing some commercial return. Yeah. I made two more questions. Um, so one was, I noted in the report that um, of the 60% of community use, actually HDC made up 40% of that. Mm -hmm. What what types of events are those? Can you just fill in that gap a little? Yep. So we're um, around that 40%, um, something that we'd like to propose moving forward is that we create a stakeholder rate and we move that from, uh, from a community rate, because at the moment we're just community rate, commercial rate. So we're really keen to, to move forward into a more 
uh, stakeholder rate, and we're really keen to explore the, uh, the idea of a uh, waiver system so that uh, there's only so much money per year and everybody applies to that waiver system. And um, so that's something that we're kind of thinking around our more sustainable models, being able to um, manage that. But most of the um, events are a lot of, uh, a lot of meetings, um, uh, some wonderful, some really great, wonderful events for the community. Um, we don't, we don't not want those events. We mm. really, really do. They're really important, and they keep the spaces activated, and they showcase the spaces because often, uh, when meetings are held in there from an HD perspective, they're bringing in people from outside. So we just think that moving them out of the community rate and creating a separate stakeholder rate um, will be more beneficial, and it will allow us to measure those um, much better. Thank you. And my final question, if I may, Mr Chair. Um, I guess what I'm keen to understand is, is there at the moment um, any kind of guidance for Toy Toy, and I'm throwing this at the whole top table, around council's expectation of percentage of use, versus, uh, commercial versus community? Has there ever been a discussion of that type? Yeah. Um, through you, Chair, we've had quite a few discussions yeah. on that, and again, like I said before, yeah, those discussions went back to prior to the Opera House mm. and the Muni's closures. Um, uh, when we had the previous model of Hawker Opera House Limited running um, those facilities with council providing funding support for them. And there was lots of conversations at that time around what is an appropriate level of split, um, you know, appropriate split between commercial and community. I think, you know, like Megan said, and it's detailed in the report, we haven't had that clean run. Mm -hmm. uh, we've had um, just under 12 months of full use of the municipal building mm -hmm. as part of Toy Toy. Uh, overall, and, and that's been interrupted as well. So I think, yeah, that, that's something we really do need to have a think about, though. Um, mm. There's been lots of talk about it, and we acknowledge that it's, a, mm. it's something that we need to try and resolve, mm. uh, but we haven't come to a landing on that yet. Through, the, through you, the Chair, um, I think it's a really interesting. It's a, it's a bigger question, and I think it needs to be kind of workshopped because mm. it is about making sure that we're still accessible to the community, that it is a, a, a space for the community, it's inclusive and accessible, but also making sure that, obviously, the impact on ratepayers is, is not as high. Mm -hmm. But it is also about how do we manage that quota? How do we, you know, it's, a, it's a quite a management plan around, we don't want to be in a position where we say, oh, we've booked our quota of community events so there's no more can come in. Mm -hmm. That doesn't necessarily mean that all of a sudden we're going to get a load of commercial events. Mm -hmm. So we, I think we've just got to be... It's always been a really tricky balance yeah. in every region I've worked in, mm -hmm. um, but it can, it, I think, a, some more conversation around how we can manage and measure that is, is a good idea. I think from my perspective that would be ideal because in my time at this table I've certainly seen conversations swing back and forth where um, we have these conversations where there might be um, higher than anticipated operational costs and therefore budget overrun um, and then there's a there's almost the pressure to go get more commercial to make that up but mm. then equally if we hear from our community well we can't get our event booked in there then you're getting conflicting pressures so I think if, if for nothing else to ensure that the toy toy team can get on with what they do best I think clarity around that formal clarity around that would be really good um, so thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Through you, Chair. Um, thank you for your report, Megan. And um, can I just uh, acknowledge the, the nearly first birthday um, of our amazing weekend we had uh, on the 4th of August and, uh, and how, how amazing it was to see our community come back after so many years of being away from the beautiful um, places that we love very dearly. Um, I'm, I just wonder, two, I've just got two questions. Firstly, how are we um, aligning ourselves with the New Quest Hotel and um, in terms of, you know, uh, aligning our booking arrangements and, and those sorts of things? And my second question is probably to the officers and the chair. Uh, the, the recommendation B about a 17A review, I'd just be interested to understand your thinking around is this the best time to be doing that, given that we haven't, we're only just getting through, um, a, you know, a first year of with very, very challenging circumstances, and and my just my third comment is, 
thank you for providing our community such a, an amazing range of acts. Um, and having been at Whakwonga and seeing where she was performing and seeing Hastings loud and proud up there with the metros, uh, I felt incredibly proud actually. So um, thank you for bringing our community uh, the, the hospitality, uh, you know, they're just thriving through those good acts and just to see, you know, what, what's happened and less just uh, coming up to a year has, has been, you know, a really a great thrill to us. So, but those two questions, if you could answer about the quest and about the 17A review, I think that would be through you, the Chair. Um, with the Quest, we've had quite a long uh, engagement and relationship. We've built a really great relationship with Quest New Zealand. So we were working with Vaughan uh, Brown for probably 12 months leading up to the Quest. Um, so uh, we've had several in-person meetings and on and Zoom meetings about how we can uh, work together. And then we've just recently um, met them. We weren't allowed to meet the manager. Uh, so we've only just recently met the manager and, um, and the, the team are working really closely with him around um, our corporate bookings and their bookings and making sure that we use the space. And we're already using it, so um, that's really positive. And on the section 17A, you're absolutely right. Um, timing is important, um, not only from giving the timing right and understanding um, how Toy Toy is operating and having enough time to see that unfold, um, but also within our current resources uh, and, and how the organisation is slightly stretched um, at the moment as we, as we navigate our world uh, in a post-Gabriel world. So, yeah, I think we acknowledge that it's, it's a, a good thing to do um, and we'll find the right time to do that. Just a supplementary to that where it says um, 17 A or similar. What are similar? Uh, a Section 17A review is something that's obviously stipulated in the Local Government Act um, under Section 17A, uh, and, and it's quite prescriptive about what you do and what you look at. So I think what we're referring to there is actually we might take that as a basis for what the review is, but not be beholden to that as, a, as, the, as the, the only things that we look at as we work our way through it. Yes, yeah, thank you, Chair. Yes, as the Mayor said, Toy Toy is a venue that is humming. And well done to the whole team. It's, it's mm. fabulous. The only negative I've heard is around catering and the cost of the catering and the cost of the corkage. Where are we at with the catering contract? That would be a question I'd ask. Sure. Uh, we recently went out to tender for the okay. catering contract and um, DISH won the catering contract. So they were awarded the, the contract. Um, probably, potentially, the negative comments um, probably sit quite quite closely alongside some really positive comments as well from our users. Um, and we do have all of those, um, both positive and negative, so we can certainly supply those. Yeah, there's um, certainly nothing wrong with the food. It's the price mm. you have to pay per item. I think that's the, that's the issue. And also, um, Council owns the commercial kitchen up by the mm -hmm. assembly hall. Mm -hmm. What benefits is that to council mm -hmm. and can outside users use it? So the, the, count, the, the contract around the commercial kitchen is that um, we were really conscious, and this is the reason we wanted to have this kitchen, was that there were a lot of um, local users, community users, that felt they couldn't bring their events because they had um, cultural um, food requirements and that um, our, our exclusive caterer wasn't able to provide that. So that was the kind of the basis of utilising that kitchen um, or having that kitchen so that we can have a clause in the contract um, where uh, outside users can cater for their own events. But it is, a, you know, it has to be quite a minimal and it is very much based around cultural use uh, because otherwise we, we wouldn't be exclusive caterers and therefore the contract wouldn't be as valuable. So the contract is virtually uh, exclusive apart from any cultural events. Yes. Yeah, yeah, thank you for that. More than happy to move the recommendations if they're acceptable. Thank you. Someone second. So, uh, from Mayor Hazel Perez. Uh, all in favour? Aye. Thank you. Can I just ask 
Can I just say one more, one more thing? Just through the chair, I just would like to acknowledge my team at Toy Toy. They are actually an incredibly highly skilled um, group of people that have worked incredibly hard, especially over the three years. Two of our team actually went through the closure of the Hawke's Bay Opera House in 2014, um, which was a traumatic experience for them. Um, three weeks after we opened the new Toy Toy, uh, we closed for a lockdown, so there was a bit of um, PTSD there. So <laughs> I would just like to acknowledge um, the amazing work that they've done, particularly Colton, Glenn and Rosie. Kia ora. Welcome, Jenny. Uh, item seven, uh, health and safety and wellbeing report. Um, kia ora, um, Koto. Uh, thank you, everyone, for um, receiving my report. I just want to um, front foot. I'm two weeks post flu, so I have a slight cough. Um, I might have to drink water every now and then, but it's, I'm not contagious. <laughs> Um, and also apologies for um, the delay in this report. Um, as my report says, it was due to come to you at the previous meeting, but the impacts of um, Cyclone Gabriel meant that um, we missed that six-month report, and we've, it's now a nine-month report, but we are on track to deliver the uh, final report, which will include the full-year results. So, look, I take my report largely as read, but I do want to, you know, highlight that um, this report includes a really difficult period of time that we were with right during the response and the um, immediate actions around Cyclone uh, Gabriel, and it is a credit to the organisation that we got through a very high-risk period of time without significant uh, health and safety incidents, so that's a really positive thing um, during this period. So, yeah, happy to take any questions. Thank you. Any questions? Wendy, Councillor Sholland. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, firstly, I would like to acknowledge that obviously this difficult period is reflective in things like our proactive <coughs> mental health referrals, because I understand that we were quite proactive in that space. And I'd just like to acknowledge that and commend that, because it's such an important area and continues to be in the environment we're in. So. Thank you to you and the team. Um, the other thing that I'm, I'm really pleased to see in here is the, um, the critical risks really outlined. Um, so thank you for going into that detail. The thing that I'm interested in, and I'm just chucking this at you as a broad question, um, because I understand that reporting doesn't always give us the detail we need. Reporting is not necessarily the correct measure, and you've got real-time information. I'm sure that's not in this. So I'm just, just looking for reassurance that our high-consequence issues are tracking going down, or we've got good systems in place to really manage those to fail safely if we do. Absolutely. Um, th so through you, Chair. Um, absolutely, Ed. Look, we um, do drill down to a, a higher level on the risk management practices at, our, at the Risk and Assurance Subcommittee as well. Um, so we've developed, um, we're in the process of reviewing and updating critical risk profiles which show what those um, critical controls are and auditing against them. So that's something that um, absolutely we spend a lot of time on, as um, my team does, checking that those those controls are working. Um, and uh, at the moment, yes, they seem to be adequate and working. Um, obviously, it's just a constant surveillance and keeping an eye on that. And obviously, when we have these big events like a cyclone, it does test, test those um, controls to a much higher level than every day. So, um, yeah, it's obviously a constant work in progress, but we do have robust controls. Excellent. And just one more question, if I may. Um, just really interested around particularly the areas like fatigue. I think you've mentioned within the report that it's not always an area that's reported, um, and there's a number of areas. And so I'm just wondering, has there been internal training so that colleagues are looking out for colleagues in terms of red flags, I guess, in those areas? Yeah, through you, Chair. Absolutely. Um, We've run out, uh, recently re-rolled out, so last year we ro rolled out specific fatigue management training, both for staff and for managers and team leaders, and um, we also did some training around um, stress and resilience and the red flag and how to manage that as well, and uh, during the cyclone response period we re-ran that, um, just to help refresh people. 
um, and we have a number of processes in place to assist. So what happens is sometimes these situations aren't formally reported in our incident management system, but they are reported to the team and we manage them under our wellbeing check-ins. So that's sometimes it's not always um, as easy to correlate the incident report if it's, um, yeah. So we're working on that as well and looking at a way that we can capture that information in one place so that we've got better reporting for you. Fantastic, thank you. Um, thank you, through you, Chair. Um, thank you, Jenny, and um, and uh, all credit to the team um, as we've worked through an incredibly biggest challenge in our lifetimes. Um, um, that, that contractor incidents, the, the near misses, and, and, and that will be for this quarter, July to September, is that because the, the increase is the number of contractors that we're engaging through the recovery? Right. Um, so just to clarify, that was the first quarter of the previous year, um, and what tends to happen is that is a very busy period of time. We're moving into that um, spring, the weather's better, we're preparing a lot of our aquatic facilities and things like that, so yes, we do have a bigger amount of work going on and there's more reporting through that period. So I suspect when I bring to you um, the final report that we'll have similar numbers because it's a similar thing. We're in a even more so with yes, all the flurry of work that we've got um, going on at the moment. Thank you. And um, just a second question through you, Chair. Um, the stress, which we've never seen at that level before, um, how has that changed in the last five and a half months? Um, through you, Chair, absolutely. This is an area that we we, we are um, investing a considerable amount of additional response on that wellbeing. So we had that um, proactive response and sending everyone that was involved with response work um, for a wellbeing check-in. Um, from that, we uh, have got people that are having regular check-ins due to the type of work that they're doing. You know, obviously our new connector team and everyone that's working. Um, in recovery work that's out there in the community with those communities, we're getting response, we're getting them regular wellbeing check-ins as well. Um, and also we had, you know, we had the workshop for elected members um, and we're doing a whole lot of extra wellbeing um, engagement things for staff like the nurse wellbeing check-ins and things as well, as well as providing training to managers. But I suspect given the whole community is affected. Uh, we're going to see sl above the average yes. numbers for the next 12 months, um, and we'll see whether those numbers stabilise. Um, but it's a bit too early to tell when that will stabilise, so they won't hit those pre-COVID um, referral numbers for a while, but they are down from the, that big peak that we had in that quarter. So the numbers are down for the next quarter, but I'm not sure they'll get back to pre-cyclone for a little while. Okay, thank you. And just a question to the management team. Um, are you thinking about, uh, I mean, how, how are you managing the, you know, the resource and capability within the organisation to, uh, are we looking at bringing in some relief from various other places around New Zealand or how, how are we going to manage this? Um, good, good question. I mean, you know, it's, I think it's throughout most areas of the organisation, we've had to bring on um, additional resources to support us as we move forward. Um, and that's, you know, we've recently undertook uh, a pulse survey of staff to understand, you know, where their pressures were, you know, how, how, how are they now compared to what they were pre-cyclone. And, yeah, in some areas of the, of the organisation, yeah, huge amounts of pressure where we need to, and just need to acknowledge that that's there and, and put in the extra support. So... Um, if I think of a couple of my direct teams that I'm responsible for, um, finance, we've, we've, we're recruiting for um, another additional staff member in the, in the accounts area to support that. Um, and in their IT team, they're getting pulled from you know, all different areas of the organisation to, to build new capability to support us to do more work in the community and doing things that we haven't done before. So building in some extra resources in that space. Generally, we're not saying no to requests from managers when they say they need more resource and more help. Um, and so there's a number of ways of doing that. It's, it's bringing in our own, bringing in new people into the organisation. Um, and we're also very aware that we are getting, you know, offers of support from around the country. Uh, and that was, you know, from 
from the early days of the response, uh, and that continues. So, yeah, we just need to put our hand up and make sure that we're taking that on. Uh, there are some roles that we're really struggling to fill. Um, yeah, there's some, we, we need um, a recovery manager in place. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a challenging role to recruit for, very specific skill sets needed. Um, and, and, but we're continuing, yeah, I think we're just putting our best foot forward to try and bring on good people. And um, if I use the chief executive's um, sort of almost mantra at the moment is, and it's something that we've picked up from other organisations that have been through these sort of events and, and um, Mr. Palmer, from, former chief executive of Waimakariri, posted Christchurch earthquakes. Um, you know, take advantage of when good people are in front of you. Um, we'll find a job for them. Um, there's plenty to do and, and just make sure we're taking advantage of those, of those good people when they arise. Um, and, and be flexible about how we adapt uh, to, to what's in front of us and, and the needs that we have. So very, very, very mindful of it. I think at an exec team meeting uh, on, a, on a Wednesday morning, it's on the agenda every time. Thank you. Councillor Lisa. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Jenny, for your report. Just interested in the 149 incidents linked to conflict and violence. Is that up? Is that extraordinary or is that normal? Um, so through you, Chair, yes, that is stable, um, but I suspect that it's not going to drop. So we have um, a lot of interactions with public and, and many and customers in many different ways across the organisation. And as we know, some of them are not always um, joyful conversations. Um, so yeah, we do we do have a level of interaction that can go poorly. Um, we do have a conflict and violence policy and processes around that to protect staff. Um, but yes, I suspect that that will stay around that level um, for the future. Thank you. And yep. just as a little supplementary, I was really interested in the harassment line and first aid required. Can you explain why you would need first aid for um, first Yeah, so that will be a mental health first aid right. response, a debrief with the person afterwards with the counsellor. Going to take a quick break, uh, not to leave your leave the uh, room. Uh, There's just a quick presentation that's going to take place. Sorry to interrupt the meeting, Mr Chairman, but we have a very, very um, exciting announcement to make and I'd like to take the opportunity on behalf of us all, because we haven't been together for some time, to acknowledge the amazing 150th birthday celebrations of Hastings uh, on the 7th of July. Uh, Emma and Vicky, um, we are so proud of what you delivered that weekend, despite the weather. Uh, didn't dampen our spirits. We absolutely loved those four events you put on, and the feedback from the community was absolutely significant. So, on behalf of us all, um, you know, we had to make that big decision of whether what we carried on and had our birthday party or we didn't. Um, and and we we knew that we had to carry on. And um, Malcolm, you might like to come forward, uh, please, as the chair of the committee and to present the team with these beautiful flowers to say an enormous thank you. Uh, I'll never forget our 150th birthday. Somebody said to me the other day, it don't look that old. But anyway, um, I, I, the, the history that I learned through the process, thank you, Michael and Charles, um, the, the joy that it brought to the hearts of our community, um, seeing everybody dance. The highlight for me was Councillor Shollam and Councillor Nixon dancing to, on the dance floor. Uh, but to see everybody um, just coming together and celebrating um, from all parts of our community 
uh, we are very, very grateful for a wonderful celebration. So thank you very much. And we want to know in 25 years who's going to be here to unpack and unlift up the lid and see what your, all the students have said, yes, uh, as they see Hastings in the future. Thank you, Emma. Thank you, Vicky. We absolutely loved, we just loved every minute of it. Fabulous. Well, I have to say that um, it's not over yet. We've still no. got some more events lined up. So, in fact, I wrote a whole lot of notes to convey to you today. <laughs> I wasn't expecting this. So, um, <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know. So, uh, Naomi is very sneaky. But, um, yeah, we're very grateful. Thank you very much. It's been very enjoyable today. Oh, no, thank you. Well, has anybody got their badges? We're going to go get some. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, I'm going to carry on because we do have limited time. Um, so we'll just push forward with the build item eight, um, page 45, which is the building control activity review, terms of reference, and thanks, John, for and Bruce. Yep, I can yep. Just make some introductory comments just on that on behalf of Nigel, who's um, in Wellington today on our behalf. Um, obviously, your uh, report notes there's a request for a terms of reference to be developed. It's been attached now and to organise someone to undertake that review. Um, and we're lucky to get the services of Mr Jim Palmer um, from yeah, former Chief Executive of So he he's undertaken he's undertaken to undertake the review. Um, sorry, sorry, Councillor Corbin, can you please take a seat? Yeah, so um, Mr Palmer's um, agreed to do the review. Now it's just around finding the appropriate time to do that. We're really conscious of the workloads um, of our building control activity um, at the moment, um, particularly post Gabriel, as a lot of our, our community start their rebuild. Um, we're also very aware that we have um, a very important accreditation process uh, in November, which, uh, as you know, we requested to have um, uh, rescheduled. Um, we've actually found out today, John, that that's actually, that request has been declined. So uh, we will be going through our accreditation process uh, later this year. That is a big piece of work for our team and obviously critically important that that's um, done well to ensure that we can continue on providing that service. So um, as noted in the report, the recommendation will be but that, that this, yes we agree to do the report, the terms of reference are here uh, but that it's delayed until February. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Dixon. Yeah, thank you Chair. Reading it through, and I looked at the attachments, it had there on 3.1 a continuous improvement plan. What, what my understanding of that is that if something's at a, at a 1 and it goes to 1.1, <coughs> that's continuous improvement. If it goes to 1.5, it's still continuous improvement. I don't think that's satisfactory. What are going to be some of the targets that need to be reached by a certain date? And how will the outcomes be reported? That's more what a continuous improvement plan should include. Um, yes, yeah, so I think there's two things amongst that, Councillor. One is um, through the accreditation process, always, there's always an improvement plan that comes from that, that's recognised from that review. Um, and we're also noting in here that actually part of the review and the outcomes that we'll get from it, um, from Mr Palmer, is, is that continuous improvement, is, is a sort of building on that continuous improvement plan so we can actually keep moving the building control activity forward in, in the way it's um, delivering the services that it does. So will he give us a base point of where it's actually started from? That's, that's, that's our understanding, that he'll provide us with that base, and from that, we build on that following you know, the recommendations that he makes from his review, his review as well. 
Thank you. Um, thank you, Chair. Uh, endorse the proposal, especially around um, sensitivity, around not hindering important work that this area has got to do uh, to help with our cyclone recovery. So as long as we're keeping that in mind, um, I'm very supportive. I'm really happy to see in 3.2 that funding of activity and resourcing is a key focus um, because that is continuously something we're hearing. Um, so I think it's something that's and really, really important for this council to understand is if there needs to be additional resourcing. Really want to understand that so that we can assure we're moving any barriers that we can to get good outcomes. Thank you. Uh, just one question from me is around, um, uh, and because this has been a long journey, it's been um, six years plus in my opinion, if not longer, um, and I'm one of the concerns I've got is uh, innovations. You know, how do we identify or will, are we, will uh, Mr Palmer or the review identify innovations and new ways of doing things? And it's fantastic that we've got someone of his experience and stature, but um, he's also someone that is quite within the sector. And I'm unsure whether we, you know, I've always felt that it needed a, a fresh set of eyes on this and you didn't necessarily need to have, you know, yes, there is an aspect of it that is experience in one way or other within, uh, but there was also an element of, um, yeah, innovation and, and fresh thinking as well. I guess um, in terms of innovation, you know, we're looking at obviously significant upgrade of our software. Um, we've worked our way through getting uh, the site uh, operational, but looking forward, uh, Mr Palmer is probably well con connected in the building industry right across New Zealand, um, and also uh, just in lots of local different councils. So uh, one of the issues is he's got a good understanding of all the operational matters, but also he's very well connected in terms of his ability uh, to go to both private you know, organisations that do um, processing and council ones. But the biggest thing is, he has uh, connections right across the country in terms of uh, being able to contact other councils and say, hey, how can we do these things better? Yeah. Um, thank you, through you, Chair. Um, thank you for this. And um, I agree with the, uh, managing our expectations through this time uh, and when this review will start. And my question is, uh, has the building advisory that we put in place in the last couple of years. Um, been, I had a look at this terms of reference. Um, no, but we are going to take it to our next meeting. Oh, great. Okay. I think it's really important because they are the, the, the industry leaders who give us the feedback, and it's really important uh, that, they, that we want to be able to provide a, a, a customer experience and a service that, um, that they come forward with, and I think it's really important that they have their say in the terms of reference. Um, so maybe whether you want to add that on, Chair, as, a, as part of the yes. action. Um, and, and also under the scope, I did wonder about um, systems and processes, if whether that's captured in the scope, um, 3.2. Do we think we need, need to add that, or do you think you've covered that in the scope? Oh, no. Systems and processes. I, I would like to see it myself, okay. personally. Okay, yep. well, yep. well, I'm happy to add that. Systems, yep. yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, that's sort of reference to the innovations and stuff within, and <laughs> as John says, we are making some um, some technology changes, but still there is some stuff. Yeah. Um, Councillor Butter. It's great to see that this is happening. I think when it comes to council activities, this is one of the ones that is absolutely critically core to what we do and how we influence our district and how people perceive us and how we enable people to do things in the district. So anything that makes this process better is just great. Um, what I was wondering, picking up a little bit what Malcolm was saying before, continuous improvement plan, do we have a destination in mind? Because... Sure, we can incrementally improve, but where is the destination? Where would we like to see our consenting team? Is it, and I'm not sure if that needs to be in there or not, but it's something I'd, you know, to me, I'd love to know where we want to be heading. So that, I believe that uh, continuous improvement program will set targets and saying what we need to be at, uh, 
operating at the consenting and processing levels of this, uh, we should be doing this type of turnaround and set specific targets. I would like to see us be the best at it in New Zealand and to be a place where um, building consent officers want to uh, want to actually come you know, and work. So that's sort of the outcomes, the overarching outcomes of what we're trying to achieve here. <coughs> Pardon? Does that need to be in the terms of reference? I think it's a good aspirational goal, isn't it? Councillor Corbyn. Uh, thank you. My comments are going to be similar to the others. I, I, I think the continuous improvement um, mark is a little bit soft and a little bit internal looking. Yep. Um, I wasn't here six years ago, but I imagine this has um, come about because of some dissatisfaction in what we've been doing, uh, which comes back to a satisfaction level for our customers, etc., and um, also benchmarking how we're going compared with um, other councils. Um, so I'd like to see some element in there about um, not um, continuous improvement, but something about performance in, in the eyes of the people that are receiving the service. And, and just... To pick up on Councillor Dixon's point, continuous improvement can happen, but it can be very slow and may not be fast enough. And we need to have it um, at a speed that it actually gets where we want to go. Yeah, so you yeah, would pick up on those points. And I think, yeah, to John's point before, there will be you know, part of the report, there'll be, there'll be actions and timelines around delivering um, those improvements to ensure that we are doing them in an appropriate pace. Thank you. Just one other comment, just in regards to um, just the recommendations and, you know, I was hoping that this was actually going to get underway relatively soon uh, and it was a bit of a surprise that the accreditation uh, was now revealed um, or something that we weren't, that I wasn't certainly aware of, understand that it is on a two-year cycle, but it wasn't something that had been brought forward when this had been, when we'd been working through getting the terms of reference. So, so I'm just unsure around the recommendations and whether we still have a timeline really attached to it, apart from that uh, the accreditation is going to take place, um, is under, is, the accreditation is November and there's a February date, um, the review will need to be delayed until February 24. Is that what we're... Yes, I believe so now. Uh, indication today from um, MB. Yeah, OK. So I just want you as councillors um, to understand that, that that is something that, you know, uh, will not be undertaken or we won't until next year. And you're comfortable with that? OK, thank you. Happy to move, Councillor Watkins and Councillor Butto. Uh, all in favour? Aye. Against? Aye. Carried. Thank you. Thanks, John. <laughs> Item nine: uh, the performance and monitoring report. Um, Bruce has a few comments to make. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. So we'll do a bit of a, um, a, a tag team across um, council offices uh, on this one. Um, just, just note, so this is the standard quarterly report that we prepare for your information. Uh, note that it does contain a lot of information in there and may or may not have, a, have had the full opportunity to digest it prior to this meeting, but we're, we're all open to um, having discussions um, any time after this meeting, um, or if there's anything in that report that you want to um, discuss further. Um, it's going to take a slightly different approach this time to presenting uh, the report, and we've just selected 
I think it's about half a dozen um, key projects or programs of work that are currently being undertaken across um, the organisation. Uh, and just while that's been pulled up, uh, just just really wanted to know, you know and, and acknowledge the impact that Cyclone Gabriel is having on the broader work of, um, of the council across um, on all the different facets of the community. And you would have really noticed it as you were reading through the report that how many times Cyclone Gabriel was referenced, uh, whether it was in the libraries, the art gallery, uh, Toy Toy, uh, our building control team, uh, almost every facet. So um, it has been a big impact and it will continue to be a big impact on, on us as we try and deliver uh, what is normally business as usual for us as an organisation. Projects up first. Um, we might, we might um, skip through these and come back to them when the right officers are in the room. Um, but uh, Graham Hanson or Craig Fu will talk us through um, the Three Waters one. But first, um, Splash Planet. Um, Rebecca? Happy um, to talk through this um, slide. Uh, Craig Few will be happy to answer any um, any questions around the infrastructure. I'm also sure when he comes back in. Um, but we're having uh, regular uh, meetings, two weekly, and the team are having weekly meetings actually on site where they're walk working through, walking through the site. Sorry, um, everything has been planned out obviously in terms of the project. And the work streams are progressing as we expect them to be progressing at this stage. Um, in terms of the one item that we always know knew was going to be tight is those uh, go karts that we're waiting for from Germany. They're currently being um, they're in the factory, currently being made ready. Um, they are supposed to be on a ship late August, early September. All being well, they'll be here early November which will give us time to get them down to Hastings in place, ready to go. Uh, that's, that's the one thing that, um, you know, gives us the most not sleeping at night. Um, but apart from, from that, things are progressing as we would expect in terms of um, all the changes to the amusement devices, the moving of the flying fox, um, some new playground equipment that's going in, the moving of one of the tracks. So we're, we're very comfortable where everything is at the moment. Recruitment's going really well. We've got 40 expressions of interest already, which is far ahead of where we've been in previous years. Um, we've, we're also changing the way we recruit. And we've had our first um, weekend open day, if you like, at Splash Planet for potential people to come in. So it was a horrendous weekend weather-wise, and we still had 17 young people and their whānau come in to talk about the different roles that are available at Splash Planet over the season. And we're going to hold two more of those weekend um, recruitment sessions as well. So as far as recruitment goes, it's working really good. We have also engaged... Um, uh, uh, marketing agency to help us do some um, very much youth focused recruitment um, using platforms that we haven't used in the past for these um, roles. So, yeah, we're comfortable. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and again, we'll just um, we'll move to um, Mr. Jarvis was here, and then urgently took a phone call, so we'll come back to the landfill. Um, Sophie, Tracksme Housing Development. Good afternoon. Um, so, of our three Flaxmere uh, development sites, we are progressing really well. Um, we're actually at quite a nice point um, at the moment with 244 having been completed. We are just waiting on the wastewater pump station to be commissioned, which is, going, which is due to occur in the next two or three weeks. Um, we have then 
got some Windows updates happening later tonight. How do I get rid of that? <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. Sorry. Um, we Town Centre is uh, due to be finished actually on the 10th of August uh, this year. So we have got the final uh, road lane and what have you going on in Swansea North um, programmed to be in the next two weeks. That is our risk factor given the seasonal impacts of laying um, asphalt at this time of year. It's very technical, so if we do have some technical questions for Craig, I'm sure he can go into that. However, it does, um, it is a requirement um, that the ground level is above 10 degrees, um, and the, from what I understand, it needs to be a ground level of 10 degrees. It needs to stay at that temperature for a period of time. The asphalt needs to be at a certain temperature before it leaves the plant. Um, and of course, at this time of year, getting those temperatures for a prolonged period of time, um, we need to wait for a week like we've just had actually. So if we can get that in a few weeks time, then we'll be really in a good position. Um, that is the main risk factor at the moment. Everything else out on site looks fantastic. We've had really great grass strike um, and the, the site looks fantastic. Gumtree, all earthworks are completed. The final parts of the Three Waters infrastructure are being installed this week, uh, Friday this week. Um, so after that, it will be a matter of doing utility trenching um, and road sealing. However, that um, AC is not as critical given that that is a few months away, so the weather does tend to improve. Um, we have accelerated that site um, delivery, so post-cyclone, uh, we had a delivery date of the 27th of July next year. Um, through the contract uh, and the tendering period, it was always due to be finished in uh, late March 2024. Cyclone pushed it out to July 2024. However, we have been able to accelerate that uh, to February 2024. So they're bringing that forward uh, significantly, which, which is really great to see. Um, in terms of um, our CIP funding, we have claimed and received $4.7 million. Uh, dollars. Uh, we have an additional $6.8 million to claim, which is on practical completion of each of those sites. Uh, so with 244 having been completed, uh, we would be looking to claim that in the next month. Um, and then each one of those uh, other sites gets sequentially claimed um, upon practical completion certificate being granted by the engineers. If there was any questions... Thank you. Thank you, Sophie. Uh, okay, we'll just go back to the top. Um, major projects, Craig, in Graham's absence. Kia ora all. Apologies for popping in and out. Um, just providing the Chief Executive information for his negotiations to help us out a bit. Um, so just on the major water projects, just apologies from Mr. Henson. Um, he's at the, at the murder house at the dentist having um, some teeth work done. I did joke with him, really, is the murder house better than council? Uh, but, he's, <laughs> but to be fair, he's going on holiday, and when an opening opens at a dentist, as you all know, you seize it. So I said, go away, and um, Steve and I can cover this off. Um, in terms of the major drinking water projects, um, Things are progressing well, um, but Graham is managing a number of risks and a number of pieces. But projects, as a complex project such as these, as you get to the end, there's always little bits of detail which can um, cause and drain on a bit of effort. Um, Frimley, there are some cost pressures in there with some of the time overruns, and they are working through the commissioning phase, um, and they're working through with the contractors around just the final approvals and sign-off um, it's been run up, it does go, but as part of the commissioning, there's a number of items that we just need to make sure work uh, and fail safe. Um, and Graham and Herman and the team are working through that with our contractor. Um, Waiaraha is uh, progressing well, and you'll see down there that we're looking at the opening of um, 6th of October for the entire facility. There are some cost pressures at Waiaraha that are focusing around the drinking water at the side of the project. 
Um, and that's just around materials, and obviously because we've had time extensions, um, just working through those, um, and Graham's working on each of those. Uh, small communities program, as you're aware of, is um, materially done, apart from Cyclone Gabriel undoing one of Steve's little pieces of work, um, but that'll be part of our recovery um, program. Any questions on Lake Water? Through you, Chair. Just wondering about the pipe work that is going on on the Havelock Road at the moment. I couldn't find it in the report, but I can't read it all anyway. So. Uh, my understanding, because I was away on leave and then come across, so that's some drainage work uh, around underneath the bridge, bridge work, so it's actually stormwater drainage work to alleviate some um, issues with um, private property flooding. Um, so they're putting some pipes in there. So, 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 so that's St Andrews Road all the way down to the bridge? That's my understanding, so I don't have that. I can right. I'll follow up with Ansonica and get her to send an update hmm. um, to, to yeah. councillors around what that project is, because I went through the traffic control and go, what are we doing here? Yes, that's what I thought too myself, yeah. and I tried to find it. I think, yeah. Yeah, so, so that, completely yeah. separate to this project. It's a, it's a, um, a stormwater alleviation okay. issue. Thank you. As a former orchardist in the area, I think Councillor Nixon has some views or something you'd like to say. <laughs> yes, it's right outside my old property. Um, and not unexpectedly to me, the drain is filling up with leaves and blocking the way, and the pipe is to improve the flow through there. Does that help? I stopped and asked the contractors because I couldn't <laughs> find out either. If all fails, ask the man on the ground. Uh, so we'll just move. Um, Steve's here for the um, Eastern Interceptor to give a bit of an update. Right. We'll speed, speed, while through. Steve we'll makes it up, he can um, tidy up if I get anything wrong. <laughs> um, started this project, we went through a number of risks. Um, obviously, with the cyclone, we saw some, we had to redirect some of our resources to deal with cleanup. Uh, and, and working with the contractor was the first time sort of working at this scale in the public estate, and we've invested a bit of time with um, Paul McClutchley from Health and Safety and so forth. Um, has been some challenging items through there, but the team across the, um, our staff, the consultant and the contractor, have um, working through mitigating those risks. Um, we are currently around 75%, 76% of people want to be pedantic um, of the Collins Road section of the project, and once that's complete, they will move into Willow Park Road and progress down there. Um, the team do have a number of variations that they're working through with the contractor, but they're all inside the contingents in the estate at this stage, and they view that the contractor is sticking to its financial um, boundaries. Thank you, Craig. I think you've delivered the, um, delivered the update. Um, the only thing I add is the scheduled completion date is uh, March 25, so there's still a little way to go. To go. Yeah. Thank you. Councillor Watkins. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, just in relation of that one incident with the, the valve that was installed the wrong way, that won't be taken up by our contingency, I hope. It'll be a charge to another party. Thank you. Correct. Yep, absolutely. Thank you, team. Um, so next on the list is the land, significant landfill development. We've um, got Mr Jarvis here, and Mr Thu will probably lead the way. Yeah, for, for speed, because um, I know you've got another meeting. Um, Mr Jarvis can correct me if I get anything materially wrong. Um, so I guess landfill development, there's two key parts. Uh, one is obviously the development of the new valley, uh, the new space. Um, and thankfully, Martin and the team started early because... Recent, recent debris to the landfill has been at a much higher rate um, than planned. Uh, so, so the, the um, enabling works is well underway. Uh, the team are looking at how they break the contract down to accelerate the speed of the landfill development um, approach. So we're just changing how we were going to build and deliver it. Um, but also importantly, just in terms of landfill development in the active valley, um, the, the seasons of wetness have not been kind to us in terms of getting liner in, and many of you will be aware in previous updates. Um, so we've struggled to stay ahead of in the current active valleys, which is why the team went to plan B and C, where we've opened up the top of valley A, and we've been putting in, um, for example, the, that um, crushed and milled household goods products into the top of that. 
just to try and make the best use of space. Um, and we're working through uh, those consenting requirements and working with stakeholders just to keep that going. The site has thankfully managed to continue operating. Um, we have had a few um, smell complaints just with the amount of work going through in the wetness. Um, but uh, thankfully, through the storm and the event and all the enabling works, we've stayed um, secured the environment around us. Um, so lots of money and lots of work to go over the next couple of years as part of that development. So this will be a standing item as we progress through. Anything, Martin? So just as part of, out of our um, waste minimisation program, um, the building just there is the new education building, site office, which overlooks where the new valley is. Um, that is almost complete. Um, and there's also work just finalising the final design and consenting for the new kiosk um, down at the road, given the other kiosk um, got completely buried in silt and water. I was just going to say thank you. That was my question answered about the education building and the offices and how far away they were from completion. I don't have the exact date, but I can get um, the team to send it around, but it's very close. Anything further? No? Um, just got one more, which we skipped before, um, is, is Howard Street. So just, just acknowledging um, the land acquisition process that we the direction of the High Court. Uh, our values are now working through the process under that direction uh, for the land acquisition. Um, we've got uh, the Riversby drain remediation, this wastewater pump station uh, and the utilities uh, being provided. All that's been coordinated um, as we speak. Uh, the stage one works, which is around the three water works, ne is nearing completion. Um, the stage two works of the drink water and wastewater is well underway. Um, so stage one sort of reflective of where, where we are in the, in the on that site, so external to the site, internal, uh, and stage three weeks of um, have begun. So a lot, lot of activity happening uh, down there at Howard Street uh, as we speak. So, Craig? Probably just to add, um, it's one that I expect to be able to manage at my level. Um, it's just that external utility provider coordination. Currently, um, a couple of the utility companies are not interested in installing their services whilst we build the road. They will want to do it later. Um, which we would rather not happen. So I'll be having some discussions at senior level with a couple of our utility partners, um, but might need to escalate if necessary. So just flagging that as a less than optimal current position. Thank you. Yeah, so that's, that's the end of those um, key project and programs of work uh, presentation. So if there's any further questions on the content of the report, Okay, uh, anyone happy to move the report? Thank you, Councillor Dixon, Councillor Watkins to second. All in favour? Aye. Aye. Against? Carried. Thank you. And in time for the PX item. Uh, there's no minor or urgent item, so it's just a recommendation to go into public excluded. And can we please just have that detailed before we... Uh, switch off live streaming. Uh, so just acknowledging, so the reason to go into PX for this um, is that we're dealing with um, directors' remuneration and just providing that commercial, commercial arrangements and other organisations need to have this conversation as well. So that's the rationale. Councillor Dixon. Thank you, Chair. Look, I find it quite interesting that the request for uh, an increase... Oh, sorry. Sorry? It's, uh, public excluded. We're discussing oh. or the, the, whether this should be in PX or not. Happy to move. Yep. Thank you. Carried. Um, yes, I'll just... Uh, no, just wait, Jeff. Chair, just before we exit, um, can I have an action?